want to begin with these following words. Words taken from the great controversy. This is what it says. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. As the storm approaches, this is a storm of persecution that the great controversy is referring to. Listen, as the storm approaches, there is a coming persecution storm that is fast approaching, very fast. We just read that a large class who have, pro who have professed faith in the third angel's message, speaking about an Advent people, who profess to believe in the third angel's message, But did you notice the problem? It says, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandoned the position and joined the ranks of the opposition. The issue here is not that they didn't have knowledge of the third angel's message. They understood that very well. But what good is information if you're not willing to leave these, live these messages of truth? Because here it says they were not sanctified by the obedience of the truth. There has to be a corresponding actions that go with our knowledge and understanding of the scriptures. I hear a lot. I hear a lot about the Advent people that we have the message of truth. And it's encouraging to hear that. Sometimes you'll hear preachers talk about the fact that, oh, we are the people of the book. Oh, but my friend, I hope that means something to you. To be the people of the book does not mean to be a people that understand just the truth. To be a people of the book are those who live the words that we read. That's what it means to be a people of the book. It doesn't mean that, oh, I know the scriptures really well. It means I live the word. This is the reason why the Pharisees were confused. This is why Jesus came. And when he came, John tells us, in the beginning was the... Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was. And then we read in verse 14 that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Words that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and religious leaders would often read. Knew back to front. Knew all the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. They knew the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures. And yet Jesus can turn and say to him in John 5, 45 and 46, <clears throat> you search the scriptures, or oh, in John 5, 39, he says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But somehow, for some reason, you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. And you say that you believe in Moses, but he wrote about me, and yet you do not come to me. And so those are the people of the book that we profess to be are those, not that know the scriptures only, but live the word of God. Those are the people of the book. Because a storm is coming. It's coming. And we are told that the ones who leave, there's a large class who say they believe in the three angels' message. But that large class, it says, have not been sanctified by the obedience of the truth. And then it says, why? What happens? It says, by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers 
are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most sufficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir, stir up the rulers against them. Very powerful quotation in the great controversy about the coming crisis and the switch that is fast coming. And we, at least those of us who have our eyes open, can see that very happening very quickly amongst our ranks. So what is it that we require? What is it that we need? To be sure that we are not of those who when the storm approaches, how can we be certain that we will be able to stand firm when that moment comes? How can we be certain? Well, John depicts the people of God in the book of Revelation. He depicts the people of God at the very end of time. And as he sees in vision at the end of time, the persecutions that they have to face, the mark of the beast, and they cannot buy or sell. And of course, we, when I say we, we, those of us who live in Victoria, know very well how that can happen very quickly. We saw how fast things can shut down, how quickly they can control us, how fast they can separate us. We saw, we understood that. But when John sees in vision that storm, those persecutions that are to come. He sees it right at the very end, attached to those three angels' message, attached there. At the very end, he identifies God's people in Revelation 14. And there's a characteristic there that is found that is crucial to today's study that I'm taking. A characteristic that he notices amongst the people of God who are able to overcome, who are faithful. Revelation 14, verse 12. You can turn your Bibles there right now. We know these. In fact, even as we turn to Revelation 14, some of you even have can quote this off by heart. Very well-known scripture of the Advent people. So Revelation 14. I'm going to read verse 12. Look at this characteristic that is seen in the people of God. I thank you very much for the prayers made for me, but I'd like to just, in acknowledging that we're reading the scriptures and that the Spirit of God is needed to accurately present the scriptures and illuminate our thoughts, I'm just going to have a, just a brief prayer in acknowledgement of that. Loving Father, I thank you that I have the privilege of being together with my brothers and sisters here in this congregation to be strengthened by them. I thank you for the Sabbath school. That was a blessing for us. Thank you for the music that has been sung. Thank you, Jesus, so much for our children among us. Thank you that together this Sabbath time we can strengthen one another. And at this time we're grateful that it is your Holy Spirit that can illumine our understanding as we read these scriptures, make us Faithful and strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Revelation 14, verse 12, here they're seen. Listen what he said about these people of God at the end. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Yes. I know we love to talk about the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Very crucial identifying marks of God's people, sure. But don't miss the first part. Here is the patience of the saints. Now, some translations render it a little bit more accurate than the New King James does. The real word there should be here is the endurance of the saints. It's the same word that is found in Hebrews chapter 12 when Paul speaks and he talks about running a race. He says, run with endurance. It's the same 
Same word that is here translated as patience. So the faithful people of God that are going to overcome the mark of the beast, those who will be able to endure the time that you can't buy or sell. Now we already know that the world is not ready to endure not being able to buy or sell. We know that. People were fighting over toilet paper. Remember that? It's not that long ago. They, can, they couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle just that. And remember, that was just toilet paper. What about when it's time to fight over food? That's a different story altogether. And it wasn't just the world that's not ready. There were many of in our ranks that were not ready. They got hangry. They got hangry. Because they weren't patient. They weren't able to endure. And so we saw strange things happen. The people of God here are said to have the patience of the saints that they need to be able to overcome the trials that we read about in Revelation 13. Revelation 13, the whole mark of the beast scenario. And so, I want to just take brief moments that we have left to discuss, study, what happens to the people of God when they lose their patience. What happens to God's people when they lose their endurance? What is it that happens to God's people? Well... We could go to many examples. In Scripture, all throughout Scripture, you would find, you'd be able to give me a list of mistakes that God's people make when they lose their patience. You'd be able to tell me some of those. Today, we're going to be looking at the one in Exodus, a very important lesson that we can learn. There. Why have I chosen this? Let me tell you why. Because of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Just come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 for a moment. Here, the Apostle Paul, you know the issues with the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had many, many issues that the Apostle Paul had to address. And as he looked at the problems of the church in Corinth, he recognized the problems in Corinth were not new problems. Because, yeah, time may change, culture may change, but carnal nature, human nature doesn't seem to change. And so he sees, hey, the same problems that the church in Corinth are facing were the same problems that the people of God faced in the time of the Exodus, in the times of the wilderness, when God had faithfully led his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, had been there for a long time, many years God in his mighty hand would free them. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul, who's uh, steeped in the Old Testament, saturated, a, a scholar of the Old Testament, when he sees the problems of the church in Corinth and sees that they're, they're identical to God's people during the Exodus experience, he decides to draw lessons from there to find solutions for the church of Corinth. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he begins... In verse 1, he begins by saying, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. Verse 2, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So, in order to fix the problems in Corinth, he begins to give them some of the history of the people of God in the time of Moses. And now, watch what he says in verse 6. Well, we'll read verse 5 and 6 as well. We'll go from verse 5 to verse 7. Listen to what it says. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And then comes verse 6. Verse 6. Now, these things became our examples 
to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So he's reminding them. Those things in the past were written for our examples. That we would not make the same mistakes that they made. And what were some of those mistakes that they would made? It says, it says that the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. What do you think they were playing? Hopscotch? What were they playing? They were, were not playing hide and seek. The terminology there used means that there was some kind of inappropriate misconduct in the way they were playing. Lustful, lewd kind of playing. We'll look at that when we come to that. Okay, then in verse 11, he makes a similar statement that he made in verse 6. And in verse 11, this is what it says. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come or have come. So he's saying the things that happened to them are an example unto us who are living at the very end of time. That's for us. That's for us. So let's pick up then some of these lessons and recognize and answer the question, what happens to the people of God when they lose their patience? Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Let's go. Exodus 24. And in Exodus 24, in this chapter, God's people are already free. They've come out of Egypt. They've seen the mighty, powerful God that they serve. They've seen him deliver the plagues on the Egyptians, the mighty Egyptians. They've seen God part the Red Sea. You don't know what that experience did to those people. The parting of the Red Sea. Mighty God, they said. And they've had the privilege, in Exodus 20, they've had the privilege of being able to hear his voice giving the Ten Commandments. They've also had the privilege, even before that, in Exodus 16, in the desert where there was no food. They had the privilege of their God raining down bread from heaven so that they could eat and not go hungry in the barren deserts. They've seen all that. And now comes a time. God says, now, now that I've done all that for them, now that I've spoken the Ten Commandments, now what I want is, Moses, I need you to come up to the mountain. Come up to the mountain. And I'm going to, when you climb up the mountain, give you two tablets of stone written with my finger. The very words that I spoke in Exodus 20, those words written on two stone tablets. I want you to take them. I'm going to give you other instructions. Moses goes up the mountain. Let's read Exodus 24. Verse, let's go verse 12 to verse 15. 12 to 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, in verse 14, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Ur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. 
Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. So, Moses is told to go up the mountain. Before he goes, he comes to the people and he says, Hey, listen, I'm going up. God has called me up the mountain. I've got to go up that mountain. Now, I'm going up there. But you, the rest of you, wait here. Wait till I come back to you. If you have any issues while I'm away, no problem. Here, I left Aaron and Ur in charge. Any issues, go to them. They'll solve your problems. But you, in the meantime, just wait. I'm coming back. Goes up that mountain. And we learn that up in that mountain, the very next chapter tells us, I'm just quoting it to you, in chapter 25, verse 8, God says to Moses to tell the people, let the people make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So get what's going on here. Get what's going on. Moses goes up the mountain to see God to prepare a place for his people that they may dwell together. Now you know what I'm speaking about when you think about John 14, when Jesus goes up, he speaks, John speaks to the disciples, um, Jesus speaks to his disciples, and he says, <clears throat> let not your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mountains. I go, not many mountains, many mansions. I go and do what? Prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you can be there too. Similar thing going on here. Moses says, I'm going up. Wait for me. When he goes up, God says, I'm going to prepare a place where we can live together. So while preparations are up in the mountain, while Moses is up on the mountain, there are preparations about this new house. Moses is given all the details in. You can read it from 25 onwards. All the details of what this house, this sanctuary is going to look like. This place where God is going to dwell with his people. All the details are given there. But while he's up there, we come to Exodus 32. Very, very famous chapter. Exodus 32. Exodus chapter 32. We're going to read verse 1 to 8. And here now, in Exodus 32, verse 1 to 8, we begin to answer the question. What happens to God's people when they lose their patience? In Exodus 32, this is what we read. Starting in verse 1, this is what it says. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. This is what happens when God's people begin to lose patience. Notice the very first thing that happens is that when they lose their patience, they begin to doubt that Moses would return back. That's the first thing. He's up there. We don't know. He's probably not coming back. Aha. He's taking too long. He should have been here before. Yeah, he should have. That's the first thing. The second thing. They begin to doubt and question the prophet's words. The prophet Moses. They begin to doubt his word. 
He had told them, I am coming back. They begin to doubt the words of the prophet Moses. Verse 2, And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Hmm. Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. It's not uh, hard to understand. They had been in Egypt a long time. These are the customs of Egypt. They didn't just get rid of these things quickly. It took time. It took time. And now, they're willing to give up those earrings to make a, a new God. And so we read in verse 4, And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an, with an engraving tool, and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aha! Notice the progression. First, when they lose their patience, first, I don't think he's coming back again. He's taken too long. We don't know if he's coming back. Second, I doubt this Moses, the prophet Moses' words. I doubt it. So, third thing, then what happens? is they now decide to break the commandments of God. They had heard them. This is Exodus 32. Exodus 20, God had already told them the Ten Commandments. And you remember very well that when God gave them and spoke the Ten Commandments, you remember their response. Oh, as soon as they heard it, yes, we, they were fearful. Everything that God has said, we will do. Only let not God speak to us, Moses, or we will die. Oh, yeah, they were ready at that time, they said, to keep the commandments. But now, because things haven't happened in their time, now we see a change take place. They now, we read, he's taken too long. He may not come back. I doubt his words. Now, let's make a new God, breaking the first and second commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And do not make for yourselves any engraving images of any sort. But now, here they are. Look at this. Verse 5. So when Aaron saw it, he sees this golden calf. He built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Ah, let me try and cover that up. Now you've brought in the world into the worship service. Now you've got this golden calf and now you're feeling the guilt. You've noticed something. Wrong. Let's see if I can find a way to patch this. I'll make a feast for the Lord tomorrow. And then we read verse 6. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And, and this is what the Apostle Paul now quotes. Listen to this. We read that in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Huh. They rose up to play, so something happened to the people of God. So much so, that God even says, the people have corrupted themselves. That's not the way that God expresses it. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, go, get down, for your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt 
have corrupted themselves. Wow. This is what happens to the people of God when they lose their patience. They corrupt themselves. And then, in verse 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way. See, for them... They actually thought, this Moses guy is taking a long time, he's delaying. But as God saw things, he sees it differently. And here he says, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves and molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Hmm. So, bringing it all together, summarizing here with this experience, we see that the people of God, when they lose the patience and endurance that they're supposed to have, begin to lose their confidence of the return of Moses, disregard the prophet Moses' words, break the commandment of God that Moses had given to them, and having set aside the commandment of God, they then corrupted themselves. A very different lifestyle. Change corrupted themselves. They ate and drank. When it says eat and drink, next time when you have the chance, look up that term, eat and drink. Some places use that, that term they use, that phrase, can be used in a good setting. Even in Exodus 24, it's used in a good setting. 24 I'm talking about. Because there it says that the Israelites with Moses, that the elders with Moses sat down and ate and drank before the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. But here, contextually here, it's not eating and drinking and sitting down before the Lord. This is eating and drinking before other gods. And so the, there's a change in the kind of food, kind of way that they ate, kind of way that they drank and a different kind of entertainment that they chose. They had corrupted themselves, is what it says in the text, clearly. What does that mean for us? You know what that means for us. Oh, friends, you know what that means for us, because we are the Advent people. We believe that Jesus is coming soon. We have that in our hearts. We believe that we have that as a name of this denomination believes that Jesus is coming back soon. But watch carefully what is happening amongst our people. Many are beginning to become impatient. Some are losing their patience. And when we lose our patience, it's obvious that certain things, strange things begin to happen when we lose our patience. Strange music begins to creep in when we lose our patience. That's what happens. Strange ways of the outside world, Egypt starts to come out and come inside of us, our churches. That's what happens. Corruption when we lose our patience. You know, we are here in, here in Victoria and Sometimes, wow, I shouldn't even say that. Be very careful because we know what's happening in our worldwide churches. And we're, sometimes we're concerned because sometimes when we look at uh, the publications of our own churches, we recognize strange things going on, especially when it has to do. Now, amongst in our churches, a lot to do with an LG, the LGBT community. Some of that now is an issue amongst our churches 
mainly as we read our publications, it, have, it tends to happen a lot in the US and in, in Europe. Oh, but then don't be fooled. <laughs> don't be fooled. It's coming. It's coming. Quickly. Maybe it already is. Maybe I'm not even aware of it. In fact, I'm aware of some places. Why? Oh, because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. He could take a lot longer than we, which is, we know there's truth in that too. But when we begin to lose our patience, strange things begin to happen. There are those who begin to question, ah, oh, yeah, Jesus is coming back. It's not in my lifetime. And so I've got plenty of time. The prophet? What about the prophet? Well, you know, the prophet, she was a good writer, good Christian lady. And the disregard, as we lose our patience, slowly, then, then goes the words of the prophets. And sadly, what follows could be the Ten Commandments. Because if we compromise there, what can come next? We've got to be careful because what's coming next is the test, the big test. And it's over the commandments of God. Then what are we going to do if we don't have that endurance? Because you see, this, was a, this is serious stuff what happened here. You know in Exodus 32, after this episode, you know that Moses goes up and he goes and he pleads in verse 32. He pleads with God. He says, please do not wipe out your people. You know that's what happened. And he says, if you're going to take them out, take my name out of the book and leave them there. That's, in Exodus 32, verse 32 is the first time that we read about the book. It's the book of life. Exodus 32, verse 32. That's, that's the first time it appears. At the time when they had lost the endurance and God was about to wipe them out. You know that. You've read it. Well, it's fascinating because it's in Revelation 13 as well where it's spoken about, where it speaks about, it says all will worship the beast whose names are not written in the book of life. And so, Jesus warned us as well. Jesus warned us. He warned us about a, a faithful servant and a foolish servant. And he warned us that we may be a faithful servant, not like the unfaithful servant who had the mentality and said to himself, my master delays his coming. And so he begins, the scripture says, begins to eat and drink. That's what it says. Same, same expressions. And to beat his servants. I'm saying that we as a people somehow need to plead with God that we may possess, possess that patience that is needed to endure the coming crisis. I pray that Jesus would become that friend and give us that strength that we need to possess that patience. Our loving Father, we thank you so much that we are we are your people and we have such a blessed message entrusted to us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that privilege, that honor. We just want to pray that Jesus, our resurrected Jesus, would be our personal friend, that we would always trust you, that we could build on the rock, that no storm that comes our way will blow us away, but we may stand firm in the time of crisis. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.